uh, Cliff, David, uh, and Ralph, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, the invitation from the European Association. Let me just... Emphysema has been described for um, actually several hundred years, but it was uh, best categorized and described both at autopsy and in um, physical findings of uh, patients by the famous French physiologist, anatomist, and inventor of the stethoscope, René Lenec, who in his um, famous uh, treatise in the early 1800s on auscultation of the heart and lungs described uh, some of the findings of emphysema. Um, he observed that at autopsy, when you open the chest, instead of shrinking away and contracting, the emphysema lungs, he said, rise and project beyond the borders of the chest. The lungs leave the chest. They are entrapped in the chest, and they are so hyperinflated that when you open the chest, the lungs spring out. He observed that in physical findings, there is a hyperexpansion of the chest, hyperresonant, hyperpercussion uh, of the chest, the barrel chest, allowing him to uh, announce the uh, existence of emphysema from uh, physical examination. But the pathophysiology was very poorly understood until really just maybe 30 years ago. That is, the connection between the anatomic findings and the symptoms uh, and the clinical findings. <clears throat> But that didn't stop surgeons throughout the last decade from making uh, many assaults on the chest in an attempt to relieve dyspnea, the hallmark of, of emphysema. And so in the early um, 1900s, the German surgeon Denk observed that there's very little movement of the chest in the hyperinflated chest. So, ah, he said, the problem is it's a skeletal deformity. And so he did costochondrectomies and cut the cartilages on one or both sides to make it move more clearly, a misunderstanding of the physiology. And in fact, to quickly summarize, these procedures were done throughout the century. Costochondrectomy to improve mobility, phrenic nerve interruption because it was noted that the diaphragm was very flat because it was being pushed down. Oh, so let's get the diaphragm up. So cut the phrenic nerve. Thoracoplasty, the chest is too big. Let's make it smaller. Glomectomy and radical hyalur denervation. It's a sensory uh, uh, problem. Let's get rid of the um, innervation of the lung. Pleurectomy and pleuroabrasion. It's a vascular problem. It needs more blood supply. Let's induce systemic circulation through the pleura by um, abrading or doing a, a, a pleurectomy. And then... Brannigan in the late 1950s, what I call lung volume reduction one, which I'll speak about more, and then a series of other more currently used procedures for emphysema. <clears throat> Giant bolectomy. Um, a uh, surgeon by the name of Conley on the West Coast collected, took him almost 20 years to collect 19 cases of giant bullous emphysema, and said <clears throat> that the bullous emphysema is important. Uh, when you operate on it, you're doing so to expand compressed normal lung. That was the rationale. But he observed it's an uncommon finding. And most patients with emphysema don't have normal compressed underlying lung. So it had very limited applications. <clears throat> when we did bolectomy in those days, we concentrated, and this is a lateral view of giant bulla, we concentrated on the compressed lung and how nicely it expanded afterwards. I, for one, didn't pay much attention to the tremendous reconfiguration of the chest, the diaphragm becoming elevated, the chest wall becoming less hyperinflated, and in fact the mechanical advantages of reduced hyperinflation, which in retrospect were a major component of the advantages of bolectomy. And Otto Brannigan in the late 1950s uh, reported uh, what we now call lung volume reduction surgery, the notion that you could reduce hyperinflation by removing the worthless parts of the lung. And he noted that after eight years of study by trial and error, he evolved an operation to improve physiology. The physiology he wanted to improve was airways collapse by reducing the size of the lung and allowing the remaining lung to further expand and pull out on the small airways. He combined it with radical hyalur denervation, very much in vogue in those days, subsequently discounted, uh, 
He did not obtain any objective measurements uh, on his patients who said they were clinically better, and he had about an 18% mortality for a unilateral procedure. But he did point out that he was trying to operate to improve physiology, not to get rid of abnormal tissue, because all of the lung is usually abnormal in these individuals. And these are some illustrations from Brannigan's article showing reefing up or multiple excisions of the lung in order to downsize it. So why was it not accepted? It was a different era. Mortality was high, anesthesia was different, failure to make objective benefit, and it was rather counterintuitive. As uh, Ed Gainsler said, he said, talking about Brannigan's operation, the idea of restoring lung tension in a more negative pressure is attractive, but it's hard to imagine you can make people breathe easier who are already in trouble by taking out part of their lung. In addition, it was not understood the physiology and who would be candidates. So some people tried this, but they thought that the symptoms were from so-called pulmonary tamponade syndrome, that it was increased vascular resistance on expiration, shutting down the cardiac output, which caused the symptoms. And therefore, they concentrated only on certain patients with a certain degree of pulmonary hypertension. And so again, the physiology was not well understood and the operation um, did not survive. <clears throat> we now know that it is the hyperinflation and the mechanical disadvantage associated with emphysema which is the major cause of dyspnea. The loss of elastic recoil, which is the hallmark of, of emphysema, gradually increasing residual volume, making you flatten your diaphragms, expand your rib cage, making the muscles inefficient and the work of breathing increased and shortness of breath, which then leads to inactivity and deconditioning. <clears throat> this is a transplant patient at the time of one of our early double lung transplants for emphysema. The head is to your left, the feet are to your right. And you can see what Lenek said. You open the chest and the lungs leave the chest. They are so hyperinflated. That is what's causing, and this is that patient, this tremendous bulge of the rib cage, the flattening of the diaphragm, the expansion of the chest, and the difficulty of breathing. But one thing we learned from transplant, this is the same patient six hours later, when you have taken out the stuffing. And the same patient, high diaphragms, loss of bulge, closer ribs, uh, we didn't realize the mechanical effects caused and caused so quickly by reducing excess volume of the lungs. And my colleagues and I then reported in the uh, 1993, I believe it was, our initial group of patients uh, for volume reduction surgery, we had the great advantage of having an active lung transplant program. Physiotherapists, pulmonologists, respiratory therapists, anesthesiologists, uh, a rehab program all geared up for transplanting emphysema patients, and so it was a relatively easy jump to use those resources to re-examine volume reduction surgery. And then Anna Maria Ciccone wrote up our first consecutive 250 uh, uh, patients uh, that were uh, uh, presented in 2003. <clears throat> the advantages, and this of course, I always choose a, a, a dramatic case, before and after, this person had an FEV1 of 12% of predicted, and that's him six months later. And you can see the impact it has on the work of breathing. The bulge of the chest, which is now gone. The use of the accessory muscles. The Hoover sign, the indrawing of the flattened diaphragm on inspiration where the diaphragm becomes an expiratory muscle pulling in the rib cage instead of pulling down air and lifting up the rib cage to increase its volume and the use of all of the accessory muscles. <clears throat> and based upon this early experience and the experience of a number of different centers, a national trial was undertaken supported by Medicare and sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and this uh, trial we'll be hearing more about uh, later uh, today. Uh, it had its pluses and its minuses, as I'm sure we will uh, discuss. But when the dust settled, it was apparent that reducing hyperinflation in the emphysema chest has marked improvement 
in quality of life, respiratory mechanics, uh, and exercise uh, tolerance. And based upon that understanding, a number of companies are now trying to see if they can achieve the same type of benefit, a volume reduction effect, by various types of endobronchial procedures, and you're going to hear more about um, uh, that today. So <clears throat> in closing this uh, part of uh, my presentation, um, my colleague, Dr. Um, John Kaharczyk, who's a great thoracic surgeon and gets right to the point, I uh, borrowed this slide of his. This is the thoracic surgeon's <coughs> view of lung volume reduction surgery. Um, cut out some lung to make it smaller, that's LVRS. Keep the air from getting into the lung, bronchial valves. Let more air out, the airway bypass procedure, or just put in some smaller, newer, better lungs. Thanks very much. It is our pleasure to invite our next speaker, Professor Douglas Wood. Doug and the NET investigators have been incredible in the work and the landmark contribution of the NET study and the results, which has provided improved understanding and knowledge in the treatment of emphysema.